I want to talk a little bit today about the importance of books, the importance of talking about books, the cultural relevance of books, and the future of books. These are things that are always on my mind. These things have especially been on my mind lately because of a series of events and discoveries that I've made that I'm going to talk about. I recently discovered that 1967, the year I was born, was also the year that two series of books came out that were very, very instrumental in me becoming a lover of books and a lover of writing. Very often people, when they talk about their, or writers, when they talk about their literary influences, talk about the books they read or the books that inspired them after they decided that they wanted to become writers. With me, I think the more important books, the books that most inspired me or influenced me came before I had any idea that I wanted to create stories or write stories myself. The first set of books that I was struck by was called The Great Brain Series, written by a guy named John D. Fitzgerald. There are about seven books in that series. They're about these three brothers, these three brawling Catholic brothers that live in this Mormon community in a place called Addenville, Utah, and how they kind of rule the roost there. And Tom, the middle kid, is a kind of genius, and he uses his genius to kind of scam the kids around him and keep order, but he's really a good-hearted kid. It's about their adventures, really. They ran around their neighborhood just like I ran around my neighborhood in Staten Island. I could really relate to the narrator. It's funny, the narrator is the youngest brother, John, but he's not really who drives the action. He's really the guy that interprets the action, that observes it. And although, I mean, at first I read them for the story, but why did I go back to them again and again and again? Because of the voice. Because something in the narrator, John's voice, and you know, John is related perhaps to John D. Fitzgerald, the author. There was something very, very personal in that voice that seemed to speak directly to me. Another series of books that also came out in 1967, or the first one, because I think with John D. Fitzgerald, he wrote those seven books between 1967 and 1976. But the other series of books that I read in my early teens, because they were about kids in their early teens, were S.E. Hinton's books. She wrote the first one in 1967, or the first one 19, was published in 1967. She wrote it when she was a junior in high school. S.E. Hinton, Susan Eloise Hinton. When I read the books, I thought the writer was a man or a boy. I don't even think I made the connection that adults wrote books by adolescent narrators. It just didn't occur to me. You know, I didn't, that type of, like the art behind it, it's just not something I was aware of. But anyway, The Outsiders, the most famous of her books, was written in 1967. Then in 1971, That Was Then, This Is Now. Then in 1975, Rumblefish. And then 1979, Tex. And then the movies came out between like 1982 and 1985. 1985 was when I graduated from high school. Two of those movies, The Outsiders and Rumblefish, were directed by... Francis Ford Coppola. They were great films. But again, it was S.E. Hinton's voice, or it was the voice of her characters that spoke to me. All these books took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, about gangs, about brothers. I read the books again and again, knowing the stories. So I read them for the voice. There was a period then where I stopped reading, more less in high school and college, and the only thing I read religiously was Sports Illustrated. And then, after I graduated from college, I came back to books. And all the books that I most loved, that I came back to again and again, were all novels written from the perspective of first-person narrators. F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, the narrator being Nick. 
Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, the narrator being Jake, Willa Cather's My Antonia, the narrator being Jim Burden, Walker Percy's The Moviegoer, the narrator, the narrator being Binks Balling, uh, Ford Maddox Ford's The Good Soldier, the narrator being, I think his name was John Downey. And once again, there's a sense in a lot of these books where the narrators really aren't the characters driving the action. Nick, he just observes what's going on with Gatsby. Jake also. I mean, he's observing what happens with his friends and around his friends, but he's not really the driver of the action. That's also true with John Dowell in The Good Soldier. His wife and his wife's lover are really important and drive the story and affect him. But again, he's just observing it or misinterpreting the action. It's the voice that makes the book fascinating that I go back to again and again. True also with Jim Burden in uh, My Antonia. I mean, he's really telling the story of the hired girls. It's not really his story. It's him sort of interacting with these hired girls and what these hired girls taught him about the Great Plains when it was first settled by the pioneer families in the 1880s. Maybe Binks bawling in the moviegoer is more of a driving force behind the action, but again, it's really the way he perceives the people around him that makes it so hilarious, the way he perceives his aunt the way he perceives his, the different people in his mm, brotherhoods during the Mardi Gras and his, and his cousin and the way he watches films. That's what makes the book fascinating, okay? It's, it's getting inside the heads of the characters, seeing the world through their eyes and through their consciousness let's say. You know, just recently, a book was published by a guy named Eric Howell. The name of the book is The World Behind the World, Consciousness, Free Will, and the Limits of Science. I discovered Eric Howell on Twitter. He's got a very interesting substack. He's a neuroscientist as well as a novelist. He's fascinating to me because he can't really be pinned down politically. He doesn't seem to be burdened by bias like so many sort of Twitter personalities are. I wouldn't even call him a Twitter personality. He seems to be driven, like I say, by pure curiosity. Um, and an excerpt from his new book was published in a online magazine called Nautilus, I think in late July. And the piece was called why novels are so much more enriching than movies, or something like that. And he makes a very, very interesting point about how film has not yet achieved, and I don't think will ever achieve, getting inside the heads of characters. It does it all only clumsily with like voiceovers and so forth. Perhaps it can be done with great actors and music and maybe if you've read the book beforehand, okay, like in The Outsiders, you've read the book, you've read Pony Boy, you know what his voice is like, so you can read that into the film. And so the film lights up with that too because he's so true to the events. Francis Ford Coppola. Eric Coelho is absolutely correct when he says that only books can get inside the heads of characters. That only books can be driven by intrinsic phenomena. That the way a character perceives reality, even if that isn't the objective reality, is what makes voice in books, novels, and memoir so fascinating. He talks about how books are, I think, an undeservedly less popular art form? Undeservedly. I guess that's true. I guess because films are so much easier, so much more easily consumed, that it takes so 
It takes a lot less longer to get through the boring parts in film. They're much more forgivable. I don't think readers nowadays can put up with the boring parts. I think that novels will always play that role, will always have or serve that purpose best in of all the kind of artistic genres in media that only novels and short stories and poetry can get inside the heads of characters. Um, but I worry, I guess, a little bit about the fact that readers are less and less sophisticated. People are not less intelligent, okay? But they read less. And they read less when they're younger. You know, when I was a kid, my parents would go to the library, they would bring home books. At a very, very young age, I was exposed to a lot of different voices, a lot of different authors. And I think I became a relatively sophisticated reader early. And I noticed, for example, in a lot of my college students, even juniors and seniors in college don't really get the nuances of prose. Like I think they did years earlier. I've been teaching now for almost 30 years. And I think, for example, irony is perceived less. Self-denigrating senses of humor. Like, for instance, recently I gave out some pieces of um, David Foster Wallace's nonfiction to readers. He was being self-denigrating about sort of how sexist he was. And the sexist comments, there's a dialogue at the Ohio State Fair where he's with a friend from high school. And they just attacked him, the students in the class. They attacked him for being sexist. They didn't see that he was mocking himself. And I found it really, really hard to describe to them that he was mocking himself. They didn't believe me. So I wonder if literary sophistication is being lost. You know, 1967 again, in 1967, Gore Vidal, who was a huge literary light in America at a certain time, <clears throat> a nemesis to both Norman Mailer and William Buckley, a great debater as well as a great writer, a bit bitchy and then bitter at the end of his life, but had a lot to say. In 1967, he wrote a piece in a literary magazine called Encounter called French Letters, Theories on the New Novel. And there's a great quote from that that goes like this. Our lovely, vulgar, and most human art is at an end, if not the end. Yet that is no reason not to want to practice it or even read it. In any case, rather like priests who have forgotten the meaning of the prayers they chant, we shall go on for quite a long time talking of books and writing books, pretending all the while not to notice that the church is empty and the parishioners have gone elsewhere to attend other gods. That really struck me. 1967 he wrote that. Who were the other gods then? Radio, film, TV, perhaps big time sports. I mean, just think about how the other gods have multiplied these days and the pull they have. How much more pull they have. Video games, series, the social networks, okay? I mean, if the church was empty then, if the parishioners had gone elsewhere then to attend other gods then, where are they now? Okay? It's interesting to me the word vulgar 
I mean, I guess because it gets into the dirty details of life, novels and memoir, that's also perhaps why it's most human. Where I think the line is imprecise, or I think the passage is imprecise, is where he talks about how priests who have forgotten the meaning of the prayers they chant. It's not like those of us who talk about books have forgotten the meaning of the prayers that we chant, okay? What we, perhaps we do is we overlook the cultural irrelevance of those prayers, okay? How much do people care about books? You know, Eric Hoel is right. They should care more about books because really it is the only medium where we can get inside people's heads. And that's what draws me to it again and again. When people talk about voice, okay, that's what it means. You're inside. You're, you're wearing another person's consciousness. You're stepping into their heads. You're stepping outside of yourself. And it's a relief and a learning experience. You know? You know, perhaps this is going on long, but hey, those of who don't want to watch can stop watching. But you know, My Antonia, which I've already mentioned, okay, written by Willa Cather. It is fascinating to see how Jim Burden des desires the hired girls, okay? The book was written by a woman. Now, Willa Cather was a lesbian, okay? But it was illuminating to me to read about carnal desire from that perspective. Just like it was illuminating to me to read, there's a short story by Tennessee Williams called The Resemblance Between a Violin Case and a Coffin. It's in, or I discovered the story in the best American short stories of the century, which came out, I think, in 2000 and was edited by John Updike. So this story, right, it's, I mean, it's got to be autobiographical. It's about this kid who observes his sister Rose, who is this prodigious pianist. And she's preparing for a recital or this duet she's going to have with this violinist, this kid Richard who comes over. And they, they rehearse together. And Rose, in the presence of this kid Richard, is incapable of performing because she's so in love with him. And the narrator of the story, or the story whose perspective that it's written from, Tennessee Williams' perspective, the way that he describes watching Richard with the violin, the light through his shirt. I mean, it's unforgettable. And it was the first time I had ever read physical desire, a man described with physical desire, a man described with physical desire. You can only get that through, through, through novels and short stories in memoir. You can't get that through film. You can't. I really, well, maybe books will be a medium that people come to later in life. That's an optimistic take. And you know what? I don't care that much that the church is empty. I care a little bit. It bothers me a little bit that my passion for books is every day more culturally irrelevant. That bothers me a little bit, but not enough to stop talking about books, not enough to stop expressing my passion. Hey, if there's two or three people in the church, if there's half a dozen regular parishioners, that's enough for me. Even if, even if it means that I'm preaching to the choir, Thanks for watching.